Today we're going to talk about how to build a treatment program for cats with ringworm. So some of what we're going to go over is the background of where our program started, how to recognize ringworm, the treatment for ringworm that we use at Austin Pets Alive, um, how we house them, how we adopt out cats with ringworm, how we find and keep volunteers, and then some of the roadblocks that we've come up against. And if you could hold any questions until the end, I would appreciate it. So our whole organization, Austin Pets Alive, started as 100% foster-based. And we were able at one point to get our first brick and mortar building, but we were finding that cats with ringworm were still losing their lives at the shelter because if we couldn't find a foster fast enough for them, then they were still losing their lives. So we initially set up some crates in a hallway to hold them while we found foster, just to give them a little bit more time. And that sort of slowly evolved into a small shed, you know, that was set up to, to house them for a little bit longer term. And then that evolved into an independent treatment facility. So right now, our treatment facility works as an adoption center, a treatment facility, a meet and greet space for fosters. And it holds up to about 40 cats. And we have, on average, 250 cats that come through that building every year. So this is just a quick, um, shows you sort of the flow through of ringworm cats. So they start at the shelter. Um, some of them will go into foster, and if we can't find a foster, then they'll go into the ringworm ward where they'll either go to foster from there, complete their treatment, and move on to our main cattery or get adopted right from there. So ringworm is a skin fungus, highly contagious. I'm sure if you're in this seminar, then you are familiar with it. Um, so it commonly presents as, you know, the classic round, crusted skin lesion on a, we most likely, or we most commonly see it on the ears, the tail, and the feet. So those are going to be the first places that we look for when a cat comes in. We'll um, examine those areas to, to look for that classic presentation. And kittens are most commonly infected because their immune systems are lower. They're in litters, so they're sharing all of the, the creepy crawlies that they come in with. <laughs> so one of the tools that we use to, uh, to diagnose ringworm is the woods lamp. And so I really can't stress enough uh, the importance of investing in good equipment. So those $5, you know, handheld black lights are not going to show you as much as an actual woods lamp is going to. So the, the model that I really like, it's the Spectraline EA160. Um, it's really powerful, and we've been able to, to detect a lot, of, a lot of ringworm with that. Um, and when we're going in to, to look at a cat and see if it has ringworm, I always say that I approach it with a positive mindset. So basically, this cat has ringworm, and it's just my job to find it. So that way, I'm making sure that I'm being really careful and really thorough. I want to, to, to find that, um, and I go into it, you know, thinking that it's there. So it's going to be important to do that exam in a dark room and work from tail to nose, meaning that you want to comb the hair forwards and check for any sort of lesions that are going to be hidden underneath the fur. So you can see. In this area here, where it sort of looks layered, that's going to indicate that there's potentially something underneath the hair that's growing downward. So the woods lamp exam, what you're going to want to be looking for is fluorescence on the actual hair shaft. So you're not going to want to be you know, looking for the skin or skin flakes or anything like that fluorescing. It's going to be the whole hair shaft. 
and it's going to, to glow this really bright, distinct apple green color from the skin all the way to the edge of the hair. And it's, um, the, the spot's gonna have a really hard delineated edge since it is each individual hair that's fluorescing. So these are just sort of some examples. Um, you can see there how it's, you can see each individual hair that's fluorescing. And so this is just a, a photograph of kind of a suspicious looking spot on a cat's tail. And so then we um, did the woods lamp exam and ta-da, covered in ringworm. So that shows you know, the importance even if it's not completely bald, it's not completely crusted over, um, that woods lamp is gonna be really, really important for screening those cats when they come in. So things that might give you a false positive would be um, some bodily fluids like urine, some medications are going to fluoresce, but the difference is gonna be that the ringworm isn't gonna wash off, it's not gonna sort of pick off. And you can see here, this sort of has a hazy, soft glow to it, which tells us that that's not actually ringworm. And then we went in with some alcohol and wiped it off, and it was indeed, um, you know, some sort of just junk on the cat. So the treatment, uh, there's a couple options out there as far as topical and systemic treatments. So uh, previously we were using compounded itraconazole, but there's some studies that are coming out that's, um, that are indicating that it's actually not effective. So we priced some different medications and actually found that um, terbinafine is the most cost effective and it's, um, you know, it's proven to, to work. So we do oral terbinafine accompanied with lime sulfur dips. We'll do the lime sulfur dip twice a week. And the oral terbinafine, we do what's called pulse dosing, where we'll start with 21 days straight of medication. And so it builds up in their body and has a long half-life. So we'll start with the 21 days and then we'll recheck them. And if they're still positive for ringworm, then we take a week off where they're not getting any medication, but it's still because it has that long half-life, it's still breaking down in their body and still working. So then after that one week off, we'll recheck again and then start going week on, week off, alternating in that way. So something that you're gonna wanna look for with any antifungal medication is um, inapidence, lethargy, things that might um, indicate that there's a problem because those medications can be hard on their livers. So if you start seeing signs like that, you'll want to talk to a veterinarian and they'll most likely, most likely stop that medication. But you'll definitely wanna keep, uh, keep a lookout for that. So in the ward, when we do our twice weekly lime sulfur dips, we have the most amazing volunteer that comes in. They call themselves the fungus fighters. So <laughs> twice a week, they come in and help us do a hard scrub and lime dip all of the cats in the ward. So we pull every cat out of their enclosures, give them the lime dip, and then while they're drying in dog crates, we go in and completely scrub out their enclosure. Cleaning is gonna be the most important thing that you can do to run a successful ringworm program. Just cleaning, 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 cleaning. So we'll pull everything out of their enclosures, wash it down with a detergent first, which is really important. And then we will saturate everything with a 10 to 1 bleach solution. It's really important that you let that sit wet on the surface for at least 10 minutes. So we'll, um, again, pull everyone out, clean everything down, and then replace everything, all the bedding, glitter boxes, food, toys, all of that with fresh, clean, uh, twice a week. So you can wash the infected bedding in a laundry machine. Um, you just wanna be conscious if you're sharing laundry facilities, 
that you're being really careful not to contaminate the whole laundry area. Um, we have our own laundry facility that's specifically for the ringworm program, which is what I would suggest, but if that's not possible, um, we also have had volunteers who will take it all to the laundromat so that it's um, not contaminating our, uh, our laundry facilities. So there's a couple different ways that you can look at housing ringworm cats. We do a combination where we have large group enclosures for um, you know, litters of multiple kittens, uh, older cats that come in together from the same place so they can have a little more room and um, be housed together in a more uh, you know, stress-reducing environment. You're gonna wanna stay away from anything carpeted, obviously. Um, cat trees with the carpet are a big, huge no. So we went and designed our own um, PVC cat towers for them so they can be scrubbed down, they can be bleached, all the, place, all the pieces can be replaced if needed. Because again, cutting down on that environmental contamination is gonna be the most important thing that you can do. So just like with any you know, um, situation where you're housing cats together, you want to look at their age, their health and vaccine history. But if you are putting cats together in a group environment with ringworm, you want to definitely make sure that you're housing cats that have the same level of infection and are in the same uh, period in their treatment, meaning you wouldn't want to bring some newly infected cat in with a group who's been undergoing treatment for three weeks. So these are just some ideas of some ways that we've sort of modified uh, the space for housing cats. So this is just an X-Pen and then up here you can see this is the top of a covered litter box that we've uh, that we've zip tied up to give them just some extra space and some extra fun. And then this was, we had a litter of kittens who were going to be euthanized at the shelter and we had a foster who couldn't come and get them for four more days and we were completely out of space. So we took a few dog crates and actually zip tied them together to make a little multiple apartment crate for them. <laughs> So we will adopt out cats with ringworm and send them home to their adoptive families to continue the treatment. And this was something that we actually sort of stumbled upon. There was somebody who was interested in adopting a ringworm cat and previously we would finish the treatment and then send the cat home and he said to me, will you let your fosters do it? Why can't I? And it was sort of this eureka moment, it's like, oh, well, why can't you? So we started working on a ringworm adoption program. The most important thing, uh, two things actually that you want to keep in mind, and the first one is that you want to make them visible. Don't put them in the back room, don't say you can't adopt them, because there are people who are willing and more than able to take them home and finish that treatment in their home. And secondly, you want to make sure that you are really honest with these people who, who come in to meet these cats. You don't ever want to say something like, um, you probably won't catch it, or your other animals probably won't catch it. Uh, we have a handout here that we give to everybody who's interested or even thinking about adopting out ringworm cats or adopting a ringworm cat. And so I've just highlighted some of the language that we use, um, such as ringworm is also very contagious to other animals. And it is possible for you and anybody in your living space to get ringworm from your new cat. So it might sound like <clears throat> we're scaring people away, but we just wanna make sure that they're coming in with realistic expectations because legally and ethically, that's the right thing to do. And so we have a waiver that all of the adopters sign as part of our adoption process. Um, and again, with language like, 
I understand ringworm can be contagious to humans and other animals. It's the very first thing that they sign. Um, and so we will send our adopters home with three weeks of whatever current medication course they're on, including the lime sulfur dips and the oral medications. And then after those three weeks, we instruct them to follow up with their own veterinarian for either confirmation of resolution of the infection or to pursue further treatment. And so again here, you know, we, we say that they understand that they're going to have to, to follow up with this and it may potentially take longer than those three weeks that we give them. So again, you know, you're going to expect lower numbers. Um, people may, there are some people who don't even want to walk into our building. There are people who don't even want to, to look at those cats. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's perfectly fine. You don't want to try and convince somebody who doesn't seem willing because that's just going to blow up in your face and their face and the cat's face because he's going to come back to you. So we've done some adoption events. <laughs> and we had initially done, you know, kind of sweet, fun, like, no, they're just like any other cats sort of themes. And we found that when we went really silly with them, they were a hit. This one, I think we had nine adoptions for our Lord of the Ringworm uh, event. And so this was um, the bald and the beautiful. <laughs> and, and we've done um, hairless Potter event. And so the ones, these are the types of events that you know people share and they are so, um, so amused by the flyers that they're like, I just had to come in. I just had to see what this was all about. <laughs> so, so our program is run almost exclusively by volunteers. They do the bulk of the work and they're incredibly important to our whole organization and our program. So when we're trying to find volunteers for this position, it's probably the least glamorous position in our entire organization. Like, who wants to hang out with ringworm cats? Um, but if you tell people, if you explain to them, you know, the fate of these animals, you say, you know, it's gross. Yes, they have ringworm, but they're dying in the shelter. People don't realize that, and they're absolutely shocked. And people will come out and they'll say, I've had it. I had a cat with it. I had no idea that this, that this was happening and that there was this need. And so, you know, you want to be upfront with them about the potential risks of contracting it themselves because, again, it's just the right thing to do to be completely upfront with people. Um, and we've had success showing before and after photos in our orientations so that people can really see, you know, these amazing transformations and what they could come and be a part of. So, um, Again, our fungus fighting team comes in and they make it really fun. They're always, it's like a party. They'll bring snacks and there's, you know, gossip and laughing, like all of those things that, that keeps people bringing back, keeps bringing people back. And so another way that we keep volunteers is our pro in our program is that we'll train them. Our volunteers do everything from scooping litter boxes to giving medications and helping us socialize feral kittens, helping us with basically every single thing that it takes to, to run a program like this. So if you tell people, you know, you're scooping litter boxes now and this is not fun, but there's room to grow, there's room to, to keep moving up in the program. Um, we keep a list of all the graduates from our program so that way when people are sort of getting disheartened and it feels like it's taking so long for these cats to get over their ringworm and nothing's happening, we can, sh you know, send them again that list of graduates and say, it feels hard now, but look at what we've done for each cat. And that really seems to, to help, help them feel accomplished and keep them motivated to keep going when things are really stagnant and really tough. So ringworm fosters are also incredibly important. Um, we, have, we usually have 
the same number, if not more, ringworm cats in foster than we do in our ringworm ward. So again, just like with the adopters and the volunteers, you wanna be honest with people about what it's going to take and the potential for it to spread to their animals and their family. Um, I've found that by giving my personal contact information to fosters, I can send them all the info sheets all day, but if I just give them my contact info and I say, call me, email me, I'm here for you, I wanna work with you, they feel much more comfortable. And so one of the, the things that's been really successful for us having this ringworm ward is twice a week when we do our dips, we invite fosters to come and bring their cats because a lot of them are, you know, the ringworm's not a big deal, but this lime sulfur, like it's disgusting and I'm giving this cat a bath and this is awful. So it's um, sort of like, you know, in exchange for, for you helping us, like come in, we'll dip the cats, we'll put them back in your carrier and you just get to, to go home. Um, and it also, that, allow, that time allows us for face-to-face -face interactions with them if they're having problems or want to share something that they've learned or something that they've started doing, that gives us a couple minutes just to build that face-to-face -face rapport, which is important, you know, for any foster, but especially somebody who's, who's tackling something a little bit bigger than regular kittens. <laughs> so uh, some of the roadblocks that, that we've come up against are, um, our summer adoptions tend to be the lowest, which is completely opposite of our intake because people, you know, our ward is open to visitors. They can come in and meet with the cats, but when there's 60 non-ringworm kittens over there, why are we going to take a ringworm kitten when we could take any of those? So this is a time, again, that fosters are gonna be really important and you'll you want to support your fosters and think about, you know, strategically using foster homes. So again, we have some fosters who do nothing but ringworm. They just ringworm, ringworm, ringworm. And so when their cats are over it, if there still isn't room in one of our adoption centers, we'll move them to a foster who says, I don't really want to deal with ringworm. We'll let them know that they got, that they just got over it and that you know, they'll still want to isolate and monitor and things like that, but um, people who are not as excited about taking ringworm cats will move the cats who are over ringworm to them so that the ringworm foster is now open and can take in more, um, more cats. And we'll also transfer, if, if there's a cat on the euthanasia list at the shelter with ringworm, we'll offer you know, hey Foster, this cat has, you know, has been undergoing treatment for four weeks now. It's been in the ward, it's otherwise healthy. Will you take this one so that we can take this one? So we're sort of trying to make things a uh, little bit easier and more appealing to the foster. So they also tend, the uh, cats in the ringworm ward tend to have longer shelter stays just by virtue of, you know, getting over the infection and. Uh, lower numbers of adoptions, so prioritizing enrichment, that's so important. You know, we can talk medical and saving all day, but if they're stressed and they're not happy and they're getting sick, that's, that's not any good. Um, so we have some volunteers who come in and all they want to do is pet cats. And I always say, like, you know, come just pet the ringworm cats whenever you want. Come play with them, come spend time with them because they don't get as many visitors and it's so important for them to, to get that contact. And again, these are volunteers who are fully aware of ringworm and the implications of that and they come, some of them multiple times a week and just spend an hour or two petting ringworm cats. And you can see it makes such a difference after the visitors have left. So encouraging people to come visit them, to come spend time with them is, um, is good for them and good for you know, your program because then they're going to tell all of their friends about these amazing cats and tell everybody that they know about them. So another thing that, um, that you want to consider 
if you're starting a ringworm treatment ward is isolation for cats who are either sick or have behavior issues because again, it's harder to find foster for ringworm cats. So a lot of times we'll end up housing cats with ringworm and URI or cats with ringworm and broken bones, uh, feral kittens, things like that, that um, you, know, you need to make sure that you're taking into account having separate housing for upper respiratory cats within your ringworm building. So that way that's not getting spread around. We have, um, during the summer, we get a lot of the, the under-socialized hissy kittens, and so we have our, um, our kitten cuddling team, who again, they just, they come in and just hold kittens, and that's all that they do. And they come in and I'm just like, grab this kitten and just hold him and make him love you. <laughs> and so we've had a lot of success in socializing under-socialized kittens in the shelter and in our ward by, again, just letting people know that that need is out there. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs>